and welcome back to Final Residence TV and episode number 30 of Van Halen Stories. Today, my guest is the legendary amp builder, rig builder of the stars, Dave Friedman, who I've kind of met over the years and, and uh, knew about your work with Eddie Van Halen, of course, Steve Stevens, Jerry Cantrell, and now this new Jakey e. Lee amp that's come out this week, which is a yeah. big, big hit already. I've seen all the videos, Pete Thorne's videos and Michael's, Michael Nielsen's videos, and mm -hmm. all those are great videos on it. So very cool. Yeah, Ben Eller. Yeah, Ben Ellers is a great one. You, you yeah, actually, yeah. Uh, you're, uh, I think, one of your recent uh, tone talks, right? How about the, you? Was that? Sorry, you were mentioning Ben Ellers' video in a tone. Yeah, talk, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I really, I liked, I liked Ben Ellers a lot because he really took the time to walk you through all the tones you could possibly get out of this amp, from clean to semi gritty to grittier to grittiest. Uh, you know all the different things you can get out of it because in actuality you can get a lot of different sounds out of it. So right. it, 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 it doesn't appeal to just Jake fans, you know? Sure. Yeah, it does. Have I'm a Jake fan. fan. Well, so am I. Yeah, I grew up. And that. I'm friends with Jake. So <laughs> I actually met Jake one time yeah. and I, I said, dude, I saw you when you came with Ozzy that first tour, you know, I, I think, and I just was like, man, I can't, I can't imagine how he was so amazing. That Oh yeah. I was just yeah. by him. I mean, I get a lot of sh uh, sometimes I'll get shit from people for this, but I, I think he was Ozzy's best guitar player. He was a fantastic guitar player. That's for so, sure. I mean, yeah. I, not not to dismiss Randy, of course, but but I I like Jake more. Yeah, yeah, Jake had a really cool thing, man, and he had yeah. a lot of really unique ideas, you know, like the, yeah, the shot in the dark stuff and all that very cool stuff. So you go back, you know, you know, I don't know your history that much other than you're from Detroit. Um, when you we're talking about Van Halen tonight. So what was the first time that you heard Van Halen? What was your entry to it? Oh man. So I, uh, so I, wow. When did I first hear it? That's a good question. I don't know if I have an exact time frame, but I mean, it would, it would have been when I was first getting into music. Uh, so it must've been. Probably 80-ish or something, 1980-ish or something, maybe. Okay. Uh, my, my, my friend, um, Marty, who owns a guitar store in Detroit called Motor City Guitar, right, right. um, we grew up together and he was like my brother. I didn't have a brother. I, I was an only child. Uh, he was, he had lots of sisters and he had a lot of sisters, but no one else. So we were like brothers to each other, you know? And, uh, and like his sisters were kind of or at least one in particular sister was sort of into, you know, like, well, she was older. So at that time she would have been from the seventies era. Right. So she had all, all those, uh, records, you know, and all the stuff from the seventies, you know, like the Aerosmiths and the Led Zeppelins and all this stuff, you know, and somehow he started listening to some of that stuff. And then he got me into that stuff. And then, and then it just kind of, kept going down that rabbit hole and somewhere in there was Van Halen. Right. So, but he's also a guy that I probably went to the most concerts with of anyone. So from the period of 1981 through 87, we, or my friends, not some, sometimes it wasn't with him, uh, saw probably every show conceivable during that time frame. Right. And that was, you know, the, the, you know, the heyday shows all the time through Detroit. It was a major, major, uh, you know, place for a show to stop. And, you know, so right. man, it was, it was just like un unbelievable. Some of the stuff we saw, you know, right. I saw black Sabbath with Ian Gillen singing. Wow. Okay. Detroit I saw, Rockets, you know, <laughs> That's right. I saw, uh, I mean, I saw all sorts of, you know, the, the, the problem I have now is I, sometimes I can't quite remember who opened for who. You know, like I'll remember. I go. I saw them. Wait a minute. Was that a headlining show, or were they opening for someone? And like, I can't quite remember. I remember Bon Jovi opening for Ozzy. Wow. Okay. I think it was Ozzy. Could be wrong with that, but but they were an opening band. That was on like the Runaway kind of era. You know. Sure, I remember that. Yeah, I remember. Um, that. saw Def Leppard opening for someone. Right. You know, off off the uh, uh, the Pyromania record. You know. First concert was The Who in 1981. Wow. Did you so, see Van Halen? With the, Did you with, see Van no, Van no. I didn't see Van Halen until 1984. Okay, me too. That's what I was So thinking. that was the first time I saw Van Halen. 
Although a good friend of mine who's from a pretty famous band in Detroit, uh, David Black, who's from this band Seduce, uh, yep. that was a huge band in Detroit uh, during the 80s, he goes, man, I saw Van Halen on Van Halen 2 at Masonic Temple, and I was I was against the stage the whole time. Wow. <laughs> and, and, and I'm like going, oh, fuck you. Right, right. You're kidding, <laughs> fuck man. you. That's <laughs> That's amazing. But so, the 80, 84 show it was a spectacle. That was a huge spectacle, you know. And and that show that we were at also had this uh, MTV uh, something contest going on. That's There's right. Still, that's right. Uh, and in Detroit. Yeah. Uh, lost, lost on the, one of the shows. And I was at that show. Okay. The Last Weekend. There's footage. Last Weekend. Yeah. That's it. Yep. Yep. And uh, man, that was, and they, they opened with Unchained. I remember that. Right. Right. I remember it was that. crushing right out of the gate. When concerts sounded loud, concerts don't sound loud anymore, right. or punchy, right. or even good anymore. <laughs> um, I, I mean, they really don't. I mean, I I, th I think the old uh, old tech, uh, you know, analog consoles and and uh, box PA's that you know required multiple semis to do them. They just they had more mid range and low mid range, and now it's all like sub lows and highs and. And it never sounds like there's any punch to any of it. It doesn't sound really loud, even. It, it's 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 uh, although it might hurt your ears in the end, but it doesn't sound loud when you're there. The pressure, sound pressure level, you don't feel it in your chest. You know, kind of maybe feel the subs in your balls and right and, and the highs in your ears. But I noticed that I was just at uh, Joan Jet and Brian Adams, and uh, I just saw that too. Yeah, yeah, and it was uh, it was extremely low. I was up front. I was like three rows back, four. Yeah, I, I don't think I don't think really you should ever watch a show these days up front because there's no stage. Uh, there's no stage volume on that show. Yeah. And uh, well, Joan has amps on stage, but uh, you, 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 need to, you need to sit back a ways in order to really hear it properly. Yeah. But I got to say they were amazing. Oh, yeah. Joan was amazing. Brian was amazing. I can't believe he can sing <laughs> like he's a 20 year old, you know, like I, there's no difference in there's no difference in his voice at all it's just it's just like i'm listening to it going this is amazing sounding it wasn't very loud but it was amazing sounding yeah he did sound great i, I yeah. saw him in atlanta uh probably three months ago and it was just, just yeah like, he was great I'd, I'd go to see him see him again in a minute that's the first time i ever saw him great voice right I, I'm yeah. incredible still it's, it blows me away when i see him man he's something else i'm friends with the guitar tech and uh yeah yeah i mean like his whole thing like he's just mr super health guy and you know he's like in shape and he's just and it shows to be honest it frankly just shows you know he sounds amazing i was gonna say you know when you mentioned the uh, joan using amps on stage her amp was louder than the pa <laughs> that's how much louder well, you're that close probably it was i was you like know, I and, can hear and, Ralph and, stage. and i'm pretty sure that's the same amp she's used for a million years yeah. yeah, you know, it's a music man something. I don't know what it is. It's right. combo, music man right. combo something. And and it and and it sounds good actually. Yeah, like did. like I remember with the other guitar player not playing. I'm sitting back. I'm I'm further back than you were, sitting back and going, that sounds really good. Right, it, <laughs> it sounded good. For they were awesome. Yeah, it was awesome. So your move out to the West Coast, what? I mean, how did you get into amp building and modifications and all those things that you got into? How did it, how, yeah, how did it go there? Well, is that, is that something that you were interested in as a kid? I was always the kid that took everything apart. Okay. So, uh, uh, you know, like when I was when I was a young kid, I was really into BMX racing and and all this stuff. And you know, I could rip the bike apart and put it back together again, and and every aspect of it. I was always that guy. My father was a doctor. And I remember one time specifically, uh, he was trying to put a wheelbarrow together. For the life of him, he couldn't figure out how to put the wheelbarrow together. But he's a surgeon. <laughs> and it's just like, but I'm like looking at it, going, "Oh!" And I was a young, young kid. I was like, "Well, it just just goes together like this," and and, and it I just kind of fell into place. That's so uh, for me. Um, so I was always into that. And so when I moved to California, originally, I, you know, wanted to be a player or something in a band, but when I moved to California, my parents had passed away and I had moved to California and I, um, went to work for Andy Brower studio rentals. 
Right. So at the time, Andy Brower was a big studio rental company with all this vintage gear and stuff. And he, they did cartage for the likes of Steve Lukather and a host of other session guitar players at the time. And at the time, Hey, that's the heyday of sessions and stuff. And this is like, you know, mu music's getting made, albums are being made and, and stuff's getting rented for albums and there's big budgets. And this is a heyday of doing this. Mm -hmm. And I started working for him and he had a guy that was making, um, making some guitar racks for people. And he decided to leave the company and go off to do something else in the world. And, and I had been watching him carefully mm -hmm. and I go, I think I can do this, you know? Mm -hmm. So, okay, give it a shot. You know? So I became the guy that started making guitar rigs for people for Andy Brower. And then later he went into partnership with Making music, which was a Chicago company. Okay. And then they put a, a another branch in LA and he went in partners and eventually uh those two partners split and making music went to a different location and then I went with them. And um and I was making making rigs, working for the store at the time. This was a high end store that sold all the high end gear, Soldanos, Bogners, VHT, uh you know, all this gear. So I was surrounded by this stuff, you know, right. in, immersed right. in this from the cartage through, you know, time. And, and eventually it's just like the playing just kind of took a second, second thing to being a guy building rigs for people, you know, because <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I was making a success of that. And then, you know, Right, right. Eventually, I was let go from making music, and and then just ventured on my own because I already had a clientele, mm -hmm. and I was building rigs full time, you know, and then that slowly morphed into. Well, let me let me step back a little bit. Uh, in making music days, I got in. I uh, had a client, Randy Jacobs, who played with Was Not Was, mm -hmm. and Randy had a, a modified Soldano preamp. And Bruce Eggnator had modified it, modified the second channel of it. And I knew Bruce from when I was in Detroit. And I had some stuff done by him when I was a kid and stuff. And I, this preamp sounded amazing. I was just like going, well, that sounds better than it does stock. And man, and I called him up and I go, we got to, we got to make a preamp together, man. I can, I can help you out with this. You know, mm -hmm. I do the rigs and, you know, it can help you out, you know, getting them in players' hands. And so we, became partners on the original Eggnator IE4 preamp. Okay, cool. And Bruce was sort of my mentor as far as amp work goes. So I started learning a lot about amp work at that time and amps. And that just sort of morphed over time. And then uh, eventually that ended, that partnership, because he sold it to Rocktron at the time. And it was kind of like, that was it for, for that. Mm -hmm. And um, went on uh, to make amp products with, um, I did a design with Buddha for the Superdrive series amps. Mm -hmm. uh, I did uh, amps with Blankenship, the, a very plex amp, which we sold a lot of. Mm -hmm. There's a plex, take on a plexi with a built-in bariac kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then eventually I started... It's like, oh, I got to make my own amp. So I did a small run of these naked amps I had done for Billy Howardell from a perfect circle and uh, handmade, all handmade when I first did it. Like literally I drilled all the chassis and everything. It's just crazy to think of that now. My, my hands won't let me do that anymore. <laughs> right, right. Uh, and, uh, and then eventually, you know, it kind of came around. I mean, these years, these years later, and then around 2009, eight, nine, Blankenship thing had, he had taken his business to Diamond Amps at the time. And he moved. And so I just like, well, I, I should just make my own. Yeah. Right. And then in, I think 2008, we started making our own called Under Marsha. Right, right. You the know, that's where, I, that's where I first saw it, actually. was. And then we got a cease and desist order from Marshall. <laughs> oh, did you? Okay. And so we changed it to Friedman, and then the, then the rest is just history, you know? Gotcha. I saw the, the first Marsha. It was a guitar center in L.A. 
at, you know, down in Hollywood. I was just in there during the NAM show era and uh, walked in and saw that amp. And that was mm-hmm. when I first realized you were making your own amps and first, yeah. my first play on one and, and kind of, you know, over the years that what's, that's been like 15 years or so now. Yeah. 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 So yeah, you've the evolution that you've gone through is huge. I mean, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. First now, amp, now it's a large, now it's a large company and that's amazing right? you know, on, a, on a big scale. Um, pedals, you name it, you're doing it all now. Yeah, pedals, power supplies, pedal boards, do that. I still build rigs, uh, you know, for people. Um, what's so the, yeah. What's the story on guitars with you now? I mean, no, I know Grover You're building right? guitars too. Grover moved to Tennessee again. I I heard. Yeah, so that he sort of. Uh, I mean, that wasn't going to work for our business model uh, mm-hmm. with him moving, and so he, you know, he was kind of looking to move, but also sort of semi-retire or not work as hard. Sure. I mean, he's, I don't know how old he is now, 70 something now, I think. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, he's, he's, uh, you know, I love Grover, nothing but good things to say about Grover. Um, but, but now the guitars continue with Billy Rowe from rock and roll relics. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, so, and he's doing a great job and awesome. it's awesome. awesome. They continue. Yeah, I was going to say one of the things that uh, I had spent a night with Grover about 10 years ago in his shop out there, and he told me every story mm-hmm. about every, you know, some of the stuff he, oh, he yeah. relayed on your uh, podcast. Don't talk. <laughs> yeah. He talked about a lot of those things to me and some things that he wouldn't mention in public. But <laughs> Oh, yeah, I probably heard him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. So, yeah, some of his interactions with Eddie and some of the, you know, good and bad things that have happened over the years with that, but. I think he loved it. He loved Eddie a lot and still loves Eddie. So, yeah. So one of the things that we ran into though, is he has this common friend, Greg Leon, which you've probably heard of. Yeah, him. I know Greg. Okay. So Greg is an amp, uh, what repair guy out there. Mm-hmm. Yes. And he was, uh, in the Van Halen scene in the early days. And apparently, well, I, this is something I talked to you about on email. Brower had rented his Marshall super bass. And that supposedly was in the was the beaded amp. And you were there's a lot of there's a lot <laughs> of um, a lot of a lot of different uh, different things on that. I don't know if it was a super bass to be honest. Yeah, but um, that's a good question. What that amp was? Yeah, it's it's well Eddie's gear. Now the way I understand it was out on the. It was rented from Browers. I do know that. So okay. what what exactly it was? I don't think it was a super base. Okay. Um, but could be wrong. <laughs> there was that a super was- tremolo he had too that might have been. But I I don't know. But I, I remember Andy having the um the guitar. Uh, uh he had a, a Strat that uh, this guitar player David Williams had played on uh, Billy Jean off that record that was um just like a, a 57 reissue strat and was blue or something it was like i think it was a 57 reissue it was like a blue uh a trans dark blue color and it had um duncan um classic stacks in all positions with like uh tyler switching which is like a three-way switch for each pickup so it was like split um humbucking and like parallel or something for each pickup and you can turn them all on and off wow. so you get a bunch of different sounds out of it but um that was a neat guitar it's just the history of it was neat you know that's wild yeah that, yeah that whole um greg leon story it it's it's interesting and you know you said it that it was rented from there and brower actually came on to the marshall forum where this and somebody posted my video about it yeah and Brower had actually confirmed it all. Said said he dr- drove Eddie to the studio. He was uh, I don't I don't mega. It was a different one, but it wasn't. He wasn't wasn't fifty one fifty like Luke at right. Yeah, and uh, so yeah, it's it's a pretty cool story. And he did verify even that it was Greg's aunt. But you know, of course, Greg lost the receipt. <laughs> oh, it was it was actually Greg's aunt. Yeah, that he he actually rented it from Greg for a hundred bucks. Oh, that's what I was told. Oh, maybe that's true. Yeah, could be. Okay, sorry. I thought it was rented from Brower. I don't yeah, know. That's what he said. Anyway, it's a little that. bit, uh, you know, fuzzy. 
Fuzzy, right? Okay, so the, the Grail Marshall, you you rewired this thing. Kind of go through that with me. How you know wh- when do you start working with Eddie? Is it before the Grail came in? The Marshall came in to you, or when I first? Uh, well, I had met him years years prior, but when I well, okay, when I first started working for him. Okay, uh, when I first started doing his rigs. Mm-hmm. per se so that was around 2004 okay uh i had met him probably the first time i met him was when he was recording the the fuck record right. and uh because i brower at the time so that was when was that record recorded it was a uh, 91 was it 91 that was recorded so yeah, like oh, well well it came out in 91 right uh, i think it did they toured in 92 i know early 92. yeah so okay it must have been early 91 they were recording it or something mm-hmm. and i i remember brower had me take a cabinet there because at, at the time i guess it would have been i was still working for making music but he still had me take a cabinet up there and eddie helped me take the cabinet out of the car it was my own personal car. I drove it in my own personal car up there. Uh, and it was a uh, slanted Marshall GSA made 100 cabinet with 75 watt Celestians. And why, Which, why did you want that? Good question. But that's what was recorded on the record. So this, it was a Soldano into the 75 watt Celestians in that Marshall cabinet, which he later bought okay. from Andy. Yeah. wasn't anything that special but the the cleaner speakers seem to work with the soldano better i got you plus fuzzy sounding right a little higher wattage yeah it just that it worked those speakers if you know those speakers they're just a little more metallic sounding and a little cleaner sounding and not not like a greenback or something which would be you know right almost too buzzy for the soldano overdrive yeah yeah i've, I've had one so that there. that's what was used and that's and he helped uh, i he i Eddie came up to the car and let me help you with that and grabbed a handle and carried it with me. So you went into 51. That's the first time I met him. So you went to 5150 to do that, right? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. First so time I met him. So what was your impression? Did you go inside and have a look? Uh, yeah. Uh, briefly, I was inside. Uh, briefly. Uh, uh, not too much, but my friend Matt Brook had, who originally had worked for Andy Browers. Okay. I didn't uh, was that. working for Ed by then. And yeah. so. We were friends. It was a new job for him, but, but right. we were friends. So that was about uh, the time he came out there, right? For me, for for Matt, he came out there in the not early nineties too, right? Well, he was a little a little before that. So like I, he was was working with me and Andy Brower, okay. driving truck things around in trucks. Okay, because I yeah. do remember he, he's from the East Coast. Yes. Yeah, that's what I know a little bit about Matt. Yeah, we've been friends ever since. So yeah. yeah. So then years years later, I did. I don't remember. It must have been late, later nineties, maybe. Mm-hmm. I did a small little pedal board for him that he was going to have in his bathroom at his house. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why it was the bathroom at the house or something, but it was it was there, and I had done that. But I didn't really do too much other work, and eventually it came around 2004 before that that last Sammy thing right. went off, uh, or the the darker times as we refer to them. Mm-hmm. Um, that's when I started working for him. Okay, and that's when I built uh, the rig for that tour, the 2004 tour. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I knew that that you know the party that happened the backyard party that you're in the video yeah right? i was there i know you're in the videos <laughs> i was there i lit a cigarette in the video right right so you know eric dover was the singer that night yep so, of course mm-hmm. I've, I've had eric on and i've had uh phil x who was there i think there seemed like everybody best party there. i've ever been to in my <laughs> life it's like everybody was there <laughs> gotta say it's best party I've ever been into my life also possibly the worst hangover i've ever had in my life too right <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I somehow sprained my ankle walking down his front stairs too. So, which I didn't realize till the morning. 
<laughs> so had you ever been to the house? Have you had you ever been to the house before other than Vicky? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Many, 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 many times by then. Yeah, I had I had been doing work with him and stuff. Okay, so, so you're, you're, you're you know he he had made this comment in an interview. Somewhere I parked before. at his studio at that show okay. at that party. I got you. most everyone was shuttled in to the right. party because there's that. not parking up there, but I got to park at the studio. That's cool. That makes so, and I was his tech for the evening. Right, right. And that's why you're in the yeah. videos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, when you work with him, you know, uh, everybody talks about it, how exacting he was. And and even he says in this interview that, I, that I've listened to where he says, I have to, I become Eddie Van Halen when I'm, you know, in that mode. I don't know whether he's being, when I have to be tough or he kind of s- sort of like separated his personality into this business guy, that rock star and then mm-hmm. yeah. How did you see that? Did you see that part of that? I mean, as, as somebody working. I mean, with Ed knew Ed knew what he wanted, right? Um, and it wasn't your place to tell him different, right? It was your place to accomplish what he wanted. Sure. Even if you thought it was wrong, <laughs> you thought it was thing. It's like okay, well, I can do that. You know. He wasn't a man that would want to hear. I remember distinctly uh, when I was at some shows where he'd like do sound check and he'd ask the sound guy. So, um, so how does it sound? And the sound guy come back. Well, I think it sounds good. And he goes, wrong answer. You know, it either sounds good or it doesn't sound good. That's the only two answers. Not, I think it sounds good. And, but that's a lesson. It's like when you're dealing with artists, you have all sorts of personalities, all sorts of people. Some, some are nicer than others. Some are easier than others, but it's kind of a, a, a lesson in psychology. So the one thing you never get, say is i think i fixed it i think it sounds good right no it's i found this i fixed it right you don't say i think even if you have doubts you just don't say you think because it's a psychology thing it's like it throws sometimes some certain artists artists it will throw off sure they're like oh i wonder if it's going to fail while i'm playing now i don't know that you know right and they get it they get in a weird headspace and they you know they can't can't function uh so so you learned when to keep your mouth shut and if you were asked your opinion then you you give your opinion and if you weren't asked your opinion then you go yes i can do that you just had to have confidence and you just had to know you know that you could do it right right you know and he had specifics which you know i it wasn't my place to disagree with what he wanted just right but you, you my know, place you, to implement what he wanted sure and you, you you're in the service business so you know what that's yeah. about you know? yeah that's one thing i will say about you is that you know you say this and it's true you answer all your own emails and phone yeah calls and you run your business and it's absolutely i'm really good with the emails I'm, I'm really really good i just learned over over the years i mean it took me a lot of years to get there to get to that level of that but you know because i'm always you know even in my emails i'm really generally to the point so if someone, I mean, I've pissed people off before because of this, but if someone asks me a question, I respond with the answers that he asked me. Generally, not a lot more, just sure. the actual answers. You ask me A, B, and C, and I answer A, B, and C. And, you know, right. well, you but gotta- some people find it, too direct a little off-putting at times it's it's like and i don't mean to be that way i i'm just i have to answer a lot of emails and and frankly um, the point is i answered your question correct (laughs) you got the answer directly from me correct right okay but but you know a lot of people will want oh i'm sorry to hear you're having such a problem and uh, blah 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 and blah 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 i hope you know your day's doing great and i i I don't have time (laughs) <laughs> right, that's that's the case i mean you run i mean i'll answer it i'll answer it all day long if you send me five emails in a row with different questions i'll answer them i mean uh, you know i don't i don't have a problem right no i mean just the fact that a you're direct a direct guy 
but this is you're answering them alone. You know, you're not having some yeah. some gatekeeper oh. handle, handle you. No, that's, no that's gatekeeper, great. no nothing. That's fantastic, though. Yeah, yeah, it, it works really well. I think now, I think now people understand. And now sometimes I put a little bit of something in there. Hi, how you doing? Uh, and then I answer, or you know, just some little thing, just so it's so I don't piss anyone off. <laughs> I mean, I don't mean to ever, but you know, you know, occasionally you got a business, you, you got a business to run. I mean, you got, occasionally you rub someone the wrong way. You got a lot going on every day, so that yeah, that's the fact yeah. that you do it at all is 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 amazing. So I appreciate that yeah. you, you've done that for me multiple times. So thank you for that. Yeah, man, I I do it all the time. I, it's con it's a constant battle with the emails. Sure. Sure. And I try to think, you know, when I think of the things I've got to address and the people I've got to address, I also try to remember Dave Friedman can do it. I can do it. Yeah. 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 yeah that's that's the same true. practice. It's just, a, it's just uh -huh. a, a nice thing to do. So the, the original Marshall uh, of Eddie's, is you rewired it. When did you first work on it? Did you work on it prior? Oh man. Um, I don't know what year it was to be honest. I, I don't have a record of that. Um, wait a minute. Let me think about this for a second. Uh, oh, you know what? This had to be around. Two thousand and nine. Okay. Wow. Okay. I'm pretty sure this was two thousand and nine. Okay. Uh, in fact, I, I I remember specifically what where my shop was at the time. And, and I know that was 2009. It was before 2010 when we moved into the current shop. Um, oh, we moved in here late 2010. Uh, yeah. It could have been 2010. But anyway. Uh, yeah, so I was tasked with, can you make it sound good? Again. And I had some... I had looked at some other amps of his and I've worked on a few other amps over time. The old wood one that he had, I I'd worked on that in the past. Uh, um, I think I worked on that. I think I started working on some amps for him before I actually did the rig for him. Okay. Uh, now that I'm thinking about that, um, and anyway, uh, so they gave me this Holy Grail amp, right. which sounded pretty good as it was already. Uh, Compared to a stock Marshall at the time, was there anything that you noticed that was different? Uh, yeah, there was a bunch of stuff that had been done to this over the years. So I don't know what state. I wasn't exactly sure what state it originally was in, but there had been a bunch of stuff that had been done over the years and like half the amp was rewired with Teflon wire and, and half the components were not original. And, and, you know, it still was a Marshall stock Marshall circuit, but you know, some Mickey mousing stuff. And from everything I ever read and things that I know about how his sound was, um and other amps i had seen they were always basically super lead amps they were they they were you know the brighter circuit they were always all the amps i had seen had been that way and so i know his amp was a lead spec amp right um it was a 12 series but it was definitely lead spec and and it and the amp told me that too because it had the turret for that and so essentially the idea was they were they brought me another vintage marshall and they wanted to rewire the original one with the original marshall wire that was used so we actually gutted the wire out of another plexi amp yeah to put in this original amp and um and then as far as the circuit goes i went back to what it originally was so what that would have been at that time frame uh with the filtering all the same and the lead spec 
and what you would see in that era and mm -hmm. and um so i put all the wire in did all that stuff and then i also had a theory about how he what he used to do with the bias uh formerly and and this was a hunch at the time but you know in things that i said and things that not i said that uh, like rudy laren had said over the years and stuff he said, you know, he, you know, he just, he, he turned the bias all the way up. Well, what does that mean? That could mean any direction on the bias. Exactly. What's all the way up. But, but, uh, I, pres I, I interpreted that to mean hotter, make the bias hotter. But then I thought about this for a second. So you, you turn the bias all the way up on a stock circuit. It, it's around uh, at 120 volt wall voltage. It's around. 80 milliamps a tube and rudy said in some article that you bias it to 80 something it wasn't really clear on it but 80 something bias amps are biased to 80 something I wasn't really clear on that i was just guessing mm -hmm. so of all this stuff i was guessing what was done and then i you know, but then if you run it at 90 volts that drops that bias to like 50 and the plate voltage is low so 50 is about right actually and so that was the concept. I go, okay, I'm going to do that. Let's set it up at 80 and then drop it, and it'll be around 50. And with six A7s, and we used Chinese preamp tubes because they were the coolest sounding, you know, for the time. And um, rewired it, and a few odd little things in the amp that are a little different, you know one cap on v2 that's a little, little fatter a 50k mid pot which was original um and voila so he said that was the best it sounded in 20 years okay. that was out of his mouth and and at that point i'm like well okay there's it's only downhill from here <laughs> yeah. but i i achieved the peak I can't, there's nowhere else to go. <laughs> right. And really, I, I still feel that way. There's nowhere else to go. So how did you feel about the album? I mean, what you it sounded about? fucking incredible. Right. Okay. Yeah. But you know what I, that, that era amp, if you set it up exactly the same way on another one, I, I did make a duplicate of it for him. Mm -hmm. There was a, he brought me another uh, one that was really close to his serial number and they wanted a duplicate of it. And so I had both amps and I made a duplicate. Wow. Everything done exactly the same way. And they sounded identical. Wow. Wow. So it's it's that particular era amp, uh that 68 plexi lay down transformer has a B plus voltage around 460, 465 volts roughly. Um and those particular amps with that B plus uh just have a certain compression to them when they're cranked up. They 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 sing. There's just like gain for days, seemingly gain. It right. it it's more it's more compression, actually. Right, right. And it, it, there there's a there's a I mean it's pretty compressed and, and I've done multiple amps since then of that era or worked on them and they all kind of sound that way. Okay. Yeah, that was one of the things I was going to ask you about with the Variac. And, uh, and I have all the voltage readings out of the amp. I have everything. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's amazing. The uh, There there was that hole on the back of it that, that had a screw in it. Everybody thought it might have been a master volume at one time. It was something at some point in time, but I have no idea what it was. So I'm, I'm going to, this is, you know, I am not a that kind of amp guy like you, but I'm going to ask you probably a dumb question right now, but you can help clarify me this with the whole thing with master volumes and variac. I understand the concept that the variac is dropping the voltage, right? Mm -hmm. Which helps drop the volume, which was what originally he was trying. Yep. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And a master volume, I just had one made for me and you know, it has the typical, it's about a 70, it's a 72 or three spec with a master volume on the back. Now I've got my normal volume controls, right? And I'm cranking those up and I'm turning it down. What, you know, are you, you're pushing the power tubes harder with the master volume, correct? 
by doing that. Well, yeah, but I mean, a lot of the distortion that you're talking about, I'm assuming it's a post-phase master volume that someone put on your amp, and depending on how you do it, mm-hmm. um, there's different sa- sonic results out of it. Yeah, uh, so um, what I notice is I notice is compression, high compression, with a lot of sustain without a lot of gain. Which is yeah, yeah, but I mean, what you're really distorting is the phase inverter of the amp. I, and most of the distortion that you you think in your head is you're really distorting the phase inverter of the amplifier, and not as much power to power section as you think. But the, there is a problem with those master volumes is that it takes the negative feedback out of the loop, and it gets a little brighter and a little shriller down low, and it's not quite as sweet. Um, the, there's a, a slight trade off with those that, that that doesn't, it's not quite like you cranked it into an attenuator or something. Right. You know? so, it's a little okay. more compression, a little more mid range, a little darker, in, you know, if you don't use that master. So if you're doing it with a Variac, what's the, what's the different? The spine is well, the Variac, Variac is a whole totally different thing. I mean, like, right. you, uh, you, I mean, you, and you can use both. You can use a Variac and the master if you want, but uh, the, the Variac, um, well, the key of the Variac is you need to bias the amp for the Variac. Right. Uh, and then you get more compression, and uh, it's it, it's like the Variac, when, when the heaters drop in an amp, the, the heater voltages drop in an amp, mm-hmm. and this is kind of the key. The actual heater voltages dropping are kind of the key to the tone of that. Not so much just the high voltage dropping, but the, the heaters. Uh, it sort of rolls the high highs off and the low lows off some okay and uh it 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 just and it and it gets like this slightly punchier thing to it it's hard to explain also a little squishier a little more compressed right um it's definitely a different sound but you need to bias it for that so it it needs to be have a hot bias to really get the amp real hot and cooking like 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 ed was Yeah. yeah but you know a lot of that sound too was was uh volume you know like it wasn't quiet and you know he was in a room with the amp a lot of the times and you know it's just it's it's kind of hot you know it's just like you're getting feedback from the interaction with the speakers and things sure like Me- D- doug messenger on that sunset sound podcast mentioned he went in there during the fair warning recordings and he played the amp and the, and the guitar and he said that uh Ed was talking about how easy it was to get all the harmonics out of it and how mm-hmm. how it wasn't super loud, but it still had a lot of, you know, uh, yeah. activity that way. Is that related to the, totally to the very act? Uh, that's, that's part of it. And, and a really great sounding amp, um, you know, uh, also at the time, you know, he was never a content person to leave anything well enough alone, you know, uh, and, you know, he was constantly messing with pickups Right. Constantly messing with you know who knows what stuff was recorded with really because it's, it's a constant if there was a knob he's going to turn it up uh you know that's just the way he he was uh and um we we don't really know what pickups were and what guitars win right right we do know that like his 50 you know his 58 v or something used later was was probably the stock pickup in the 58 v you know and but some of the early stuff, God knows what was in it. Right. You know, there was the original 335 pickup, but then that pickup eventually got rewound by Seymour Duncan. Right. Uh, and that created supposedly the 78 pickup, which is a great pickup. Um, and then, you know, and then from there, I think he went to hotter pickups, you know, like I think I think it got went up. I think at one point in time there was a JB. Mm-hmm. Uh the the 5150 guitar uh had a JB in it for sure. Yep, with a broken coil later. <laughs> so, uh, um, uh, you know, so I think fair. I, I have a theory that fair warning was a JB. Okay, it sounds significantly different, and it's darker of a tone and thicker of a tone. Right, and it's considerably different. There's a like harder, tone. harder edge, like when. Uh... I just noticed this, the hard, the low end on that, on the drop D, there's a hard edge to it that, that you don't, I just don't never, you just almost never find it exactly. No, I don't know what, I don't know really what it was, but to me, like even some of the lead stuff, it just sounds, I don't like a JB sounds. Mm-hmm. 
and um possible it'd be right. a custom custom for all we know i don't know right, right, could, right. could could be anything but uh it was different definitely different than say van halen 2 which is my favorite yeah the custom custom now i used that in a video that i did with the uh, jj and i did a comparison between the jj the small box and the little bitty one the little b e mm -hmm, mini, mm -hmm. right? and i and i played that all with the custom custom and that that pickup sound. i remember that video i saw that i remember it, yeah. it sounds a lot like yeah. it it does it's amazing i you know what the thing is is like he sounds a lot like, you know he sounded a lot like him even when he played <laughs> with the land that's right <laughs> you know like you 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 heard those i mean those uh old uh Stephen rosen uh audio oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. where he's sitting there talking about van halen too in the album and ed's showing him it clean oh yeah yeah but he's playing totally clean, but he has all the harmonics and sustain and all the everything that he did into an amp. Right. It's amazing. You know, it, it, you're like, he had incredibly strong hands. Yeah, you watched if it. He shook, if he shook your hand, it, yeah. it, it, it it's going to hurt. Yeah. It was like really strong hands. But he, and, didn't have, he didn't have long fingers. He had pretty normal length, but he had big, thick hands. Yeah, thick hands and strong strength, big big time strength, and uh, and uh, yeah, it was. Uh, I remember that. But when you think about that, when he's playing clean in those 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 tapes, mm -hmm. totally clean, you're hearing all the pinch harmonics and everything, and it's totally clean. So, yeah, did he need that much stuff or that much gain? Really, no. Obviously, he could do it clean at that point in time, at least you know. So somebody said his game pedal was his hands. Yeah. That's what, I mean, you've heard that before, probably. But, yeah, sure, 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 sure. Uh, there, I, I, I agree. There, there is this one other theory, and this is a crazy theory, but this has come up in a recent video a guy just did yesterday about him um, using multiple amps in the on the first album to slave each other or some combination that would have gotten him that sound that's different than Van Halen 2 and on. Do you subscribe to any of that? I don't know, but I do know. I, I I don't really know what happened on the first record. I just don't know. Right. I mean, I was told it was only one amp all the time. All the records are the same amp. Right. All the ones that we right. that that you know we grew to love. Um. Uh. Now in the first record, I know he hated the first record tone. Right. Right. He said that. So yeah. it, it it was too bright. He didn't really like it. What he did exactly, I don't know. Yeah, this is a funny he story. didn't know. He You're didn't right. right. He didn't remember. He didn't remember a lot of things. <laughs> no, he didn't remember at all what he did then. Not at all. This is a funny story. Dweezil Zappa just had a podcast with uh, John Shanks, who did the last album, right? Did right. Different kind of truth album, and apparently he was. Oh, I didn't. I, didn't, I haven't seen that. I got to see that. Okay. Well, apparently in the uh, in this particular interview, uh, Shanks says that he had Eddie in there, and they had three rigs set up, and they were blending the three rigs. This and is correct. One, and one of those rigs was the Marshall. Yep. Okay. So Shanks said he kept trying to push the Marshall into the mix. Yep. And throw the reverb off to one side, and he said every time Eddie would hear it, he'd be like, "We, you know, we stop." He said the reason I play that other amp now is because it makes me work less hard. You know, it's easier to play it. And uh, that's kind of like, I guess, where his head was with the 5150. He wanted it to do all the things it did back in the day. Maybe the Marshall did back in the day. With yeah. Things, you know, he was kind of going. It easier. I know it's a lot more gainy. We always talk about how much more gainy it is. And it has a, I own one before your amp. And um, I, I actually got rid of it. But it has this upper mid-range, like. Cocked wah. Yeah. That. Mm -hmm. what, yeah. Why is that? And why did he like that? I don't really know. The, the funny thing is he always said he hated mid-range. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, to me, that's mid-range. It's upper mid-range. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. upper mids, but to me, to me, that's kind of mid. Like, yeah. 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 Mid. And, and so, obviously, he didn't hate that. Right. Uh, uh, I don't know. You know. When I first got that amp, you know, I was like, I really kind of liked it at first. I thought, well, it sounds really good. But after a while, that particular thing that yeah the upper mid-range was something that i just couldn't like yeah i would have to agree with you yeah uh, 
There's something I've about it. some. I've heard some newer ones that were have been a little bit better with that. Like uh, I did a rig for Jason Hook recently. Mm -hmm. uh, he had uh, the EL34 Bell one, I guess, or something. Right, right. More gain than you know what to do with. But uh, I, you know, I thought it sounded pretty good actually. I think it was pretty good sounding amp, but it seems more of a metal amp to me. Yeah, right, right. And it yeah. has the amazing things in that in that realm. I mean, it's been the I don't think it did the you know, the thing is is like the the sound that we all love, I don't think he liked. Right. <laughs> you know, it, it's it's like it it's I think he was always searching for something more. Right. But the thing is is that like the holy grail sound, you know. It's <laughs> like to this day people are still asking for it, you right. know. Talk about how do I get that? Well, you don't have well, first of all, you need his hands, right? Right, <laughs> so that's the first problem, uh, you know. Um, but yeah, that, I, I think uh, it had more of an organic kind of nature to it as opposed to the latter, which wasn't as organic, you know. Sure, sure. One of the other big mysteries is the, the whole speaker thing now this is a crazy story that i ran across a long time ago actually last year when i was out there for uh some interviews that i did for the for this channel one of them was that those jbl speakers that are in they weren't jbls they were the radio shack they were, they were radio shack speakers well the, the latest theory is that that well coming from people that were in pasadena that worked with him doug anderson i don't know if you know doug anderson i know of him yeah okay, well, doug anderson was a uh, part of this recent video that released the information from it. And I know Doug. Uh, he said that whenever Ed would blow speakers, he would just put these radio shacks in to fill the holes and that he preferred 25 watts less gens over the, over, you know, mm -hmm. and that was mm -hmm. his main thing. And that was kind of why they were even there. And then when you see the picture of the cabinet in the, in the studio, you see a slant and every picture that I've seen, you see it in a straight with the JBL cone types. Yeah. So I, I don't know. You know, there's one picture in the studio in 80 where the cabinet, the slant, is sitting basically where it was sitting for Van Halen 1 recording, but the bottom is covered up with two boxes. <laughs> and you can't see what the speakers are at the bottom of it. But Who knows? I don't, I don't know if it matters, really. I mean, like, there's another thing, too. We kind of analyzed some... Uh, Keith Thorne and I kind of analyzed some, uh, some of the raw... We had some raw tracks... And he put an EQ analyzer on on both the mics. What what assumed would be maybe the JBL or something, and and definitely one that was the Greenback. Mm -hmm. They definitely sounded way different. But when you looked at it on an EQ spectrum, there was like this huge boost at like 12k that was really high. For, it could have been just EQ'd that way, sure, because it definitely looked EQ'd. It didn't look like a curve of a speaker. It looked could have been the mic was center placed, uh, two mics, and uh, one, one and, of the theories is that now it's that that one was right on the at the the joint uh, does cap. The other turned across. Looking, it at could it. be uh, that that was something that I seen Don Landy do before, where uh, true, but I actually judging from how that sounded, I kind of think the one was center. For sure, and then even brightened up more. Right in post. So and and blended in, uh, not post, go recording to tape. Okay, straight down. Boosted right through through whatever mic pre they were using at the time, the EQ and the mic pre. Yeah, right. right. And I, uh, yeah, yeah. It's just it's just we'll never know. Right? Not unless Don Landy. You don't really it. know. Not <laughs> unless you can get Don Landy interview, which I'd love to do. Right. I know everybody yeah. here for that one. <laughs> yeah. We'd love, I'd to, love that. to do that. Right. right. Well, that would be, be amazing. So let's see the, um, you know, when actually when Pete did his deep dives with all of this yeah. speakers and, and then Jim Gostad, who I've had on here as well. Yeah. Uh, they did their amazing deep dives. You know, I, I was kind of convinced it was to JBL. <laughs> I mean, it seemed like it was. Well, you know, it, I mean, I think you can make anything sound like, you know, if you work on it hard enough. I mean, yeah, we were, I worked on the amp with Pete on that one. It was my amp uh, that he used. And, um, you know, that was just a, a early 70s Marshall that I just kind of turned into that spec. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it wasn't perfect, but it, it was pretty good. And, uh, 
and you know we did the whole variac thing we did the whole bias thing and did all that yeah yeah, I listened to all that. And it's like, yeah, yeah, of course. Right? It, was a, it was amazing, man. I mean, it was amazing. The pickup hole, the pickup shootout was amazing. It was, it's, you know, and I, I was kind of like, yeah, it might've been the super distortion on the shark. I, I don't know. I mean, yeah. And then that pickup, we had the original mighty might pickup too. That was awesome in that shootout. I, I thought, um, but the super distortion was great. And who knows? Who knows? We don't really know what was in this, in the stuff. That's crazy. Right? Know. So they really mattered. I mean, I think I think ultimately, like him playing, it sounds like Eddie. Right. You know, I don't think it really matters. Right, right. That's true. you gotta have the hands. You gotta have the hands to do it. So here's, here's something that that you know, I, I, from a time perspective, going back to the early '90s and knowing what was going on with Marshall and just gen generally, there wasn't a lot of signature anything. There wasn't signature guitars, there wasn't signature amps, you know, that was no man. Kind of the thing that was brewing. Uh, like you'd see ads, like I had this guitar in Ibanez Roadstar and they used to put Gary Moore in it and mm -hmm. ads, you know, or put Steve Lukather in the ads for that same guitar, sure. but they never went, this is the Steve Lukather guitar. Yeah. That was before all that. Yeah. So, when Eddie came, you know, through all these changes, there would have been no Marshall signature amp. I don't know, remember when the first one came out. Well, time. I mean, I remember specifically in the early 90s with him, uh, he, he, I remember specifically he was, well, it was either, hmm. Okay, it's a little foggy, but I remember Jose being at a NAM show and me running into him because I knew him then. And they were trying, I didn't see Ed at that point, but they were trying to shop uh, their amp that Jose had made. Okay. The amp that no one knows whatever happened to. Wow. I saw it. Really? I saw it at a shop. No one knows whatever happened to this amp. It's a mystery where it went. Ed didn't know what happened to it. No one knew what happened to it. Jose died, and no one knows where it went. So they were shopping an actual amp that Jose was going to be. Putting yeah, out. I mean, it was it was an amp. I remember seeing it. It had it, it was like two channels, and it had uh, one channel that was covered. It was it was huge. The amp was like the size of an SVT. Um, but but he. he uh, uh, Jose showed it to me. He didn't play through it, but he just showed me. Yeah, that's the amp we're working on with Ed and and stuff. And Ed sunk a bunch of money into it, and no, no one knew what happened to it. Wow, the mystery where it went. It'd be amazing if it turned up one day, <laughs> right? But I don't, I don't think it's going to turn up. I think it was probably trashed at some point in time. With when I, I don't know. Maybe his family has it. I have no idea. Wow. It's a mystery. You think it would come up already by now? Could be in 5150's stash. I don't know. That you, no, they don't have it. They didn't have it. it. Okay, you know that. Never had it. Wow, okay. You know, I guess he could have went to Marshall at some point if he wanted that, but apparently he didn't like that, so why bother with Marshall, I guess, huh? Yeah, I don't know. I think PV got into the picture, and then... Soldana was in the, in the early... You know, he and then... Made that, made that amp that was a, practically a... Well, well, yeah, I mean, like, Soldano was in there, but it never became, like, they went to PV, you know, not not right, having yeah. Mike do it. But he used Soldano, you know, for sure. a while there. Sure, I remember I was at the NAMM show in 91 when he played it at that jam with Albert Lee. I was there. You were there? Yeah. yeah. It seems like all, all my guests were there. I, I, was, I was definitely <laughs> there. Albert Lee, and didn't Steve Lukather play, too, or something? It was uh, Albert Lee and Steve Morris. Oh yeah, you know I was there. Yeah, uh, yeah, I yeah, was totally there, remember. down front, and um, yeah, the, I think Steve Brown, who's been on, he was there. Uh, Phil X was there, I think. It's amazing. Probably before I knew him. I mean, it's amazing how many people were actually at this that we yeah, were, were all standing in the same. Well, room. I was at the famous uh, famous show where Eddie sat in at the baked potato mm. with Steve Lukather and Mike sure. Landau. Yeah, I so, watched that whole show. Yeah, what do they do? What kind of stuff do they do? Oh, they, there's one. There's a there's a yeah. audio recording on YouTube about uh, of some classic song. I forgot what song it was. Uh, there might even be more than one recording. Wow, it's crazy. Yeah. It was interesting. It's fun. 
you hear the stealth, you know, I heard it on that final tour. I happened to see them outside for the first time in my, my life. And it was fantastic sounding. I was like, wow. Okay. This amp sounds amazing. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, I think it was better towards the end, you know, um, for sure. Uh, there was some, you know, weird times in the middle there, but you know, I'm glad right. he, I guess, happy and good in the end, you know, that party for all the people that were there was really special, even though it was, you know, it was a dark time for him, but everybody yeah. that was there was this, you know, Oh, that party night. Yeah. That was, that was fun. Well, you know, it's funny because it, he was, you know, brought up with these backyard parties. <laughs> and then he has this. Well, you know, the funny thing is it was, it was, it was, it was kind of, kind of surreal, you know, uh, because, uh, you know, you, you you were walking in and you were seeing these trapeze artists on trapezes and and Cirque du Soleil almost like performers and uh, topless women sliding down the pool slide into the pool and and like all this stuff's going on. It's like, what the heck's going on here? This is awesome. Right, you know, right. like open bars everywhere you looked. You know, there's like a main bar and a mojito bar and a margarita bar and a that just was bad <laughs> yeah he and it was even worse because i went there with some my wife and some friends uh two two friends and um and i was doing that i was working essentially for for, for a while right right the time i was done working she was a she was obliterated she was drunk, <laughs> drunk as could be and i'm like going, oh my god shut up give me a drink let me start drinking so i can catch up <laughs> please <laughs> well, and then then we all were they, we were all gone by the end of that you know looking back at the stories are there any other stories that you could share that you have with ed personally that is personality or something that that's a little bit more personal you know, I mean, like, I, I think, uh, you know, he was a wonderful, he can be a wonderful guy, uh, you know, and very uh, loving. Um, I remember um, I had to, I don't know what tour this was on. This was probably pre er, uh, a David Lee tour. Um, early David Lee tour, pre, pre the sobriety break. Um I was flown. Okay. I, there was something going on with the rig or the amps. We weren't sure which. So that I went to Chicago, uh, for a show and, uh, my wife went with me and we were in Chicago. They were playing two nights with a, a night off in between. And we looked at everything and I don't think there was really anything wrong to be honest, but went through the amps and with, with Mike uh, Ulrich, who was the time working for Fender. And we um, didn't really find anything going wrong, but we did our due diligence and made sure everything was good. And, and then we, I had to stay till the next show, the next, the uh, skipping a night, had a day off and then went there. Everything went well, everything went, went home, you know, no problem. Then I get a phone call. Like literally I got home on like a Saturday or something and get a phone call on Sunday. Uh, yeah. And load out to, or it, maybe I got home on Friday, whatever it was. I, I get a call. Yeah. And load out today. They dropped his rack off the loading dock and onto, onto the ground. And so any chance you could fly out to Detroit <laughs> And uh, he had just got back. It's like, <laughs> sure, yeah, I can do that. We'll fly out to Detroit, and um, so flew back out. Uh, and I hadn't seen my childhood friend Marty from Motor City Guitar. I hadn't seen him for a million years. Right, like we just not intentionally, but we just didn't talk for years a million years, you know? And I'm like, oh man, I'm going to Detroit. And I hadn't even been back in Detroit uh, since I was a kid, you know? And, and I was like, oh, I'm going back. I gotta, I gotta call Marty up and, 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 and see what he's doing or whatever. And I, uh, I go, I wonder if the store will give me his phone number, you know? So I call the store and I'm like, okay, I'm just going to tell the guy, you know, who I am and what the deal is. And, uh, 
And he, Marty, Marty answered the phone. So <laughs> I go, Hey, I'm coming to Detroit, man. And you know, we're just chatting for a while. I go, you want to come hang out with me at the Van Halen show? You know, I'm going to come work and he goes, yeah, you know, and he, he comes and we're, uh, I, I do the work. I, I do the, had to fix a few little minor things, fixed a few minor things backstage. We're hanging out and, and we, we go out sort of near the stage. So. Ed comes for sound check. He comes up. Oh, thanks for coming out. You know, he's like to me and I go, Hey, Ed, this is uh, who, who I would consider my brother, a uh, friend of mine, you know, uh, Marty. And he goes, Oh, and he just, he just grabs him and gives him a bear hug. <laughs> and he, he, from my friend's perspective, you got to think, Oh my God, my childhood hero is giving me a hug and a kiss right now right he's like ah he's just like i didn't know what to do <laughs> right, right and then he proceeds to go up on stage and you know sound check and kick ass and you know rip for a little bit and and everything was good and and you know but 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 my friend still uh, tells that story you know he's like you know i got hugged kissed by eddie van halen made his life man right yeah that's, yeah that's amazing yeah eddie you know he did that like people said you know depending on how much comfort he had you get it on the lips if you were too close <laughs> yeah especially especially kind of in in that, that era especially uh you know if he had been drinking or this or that especially you got a very emotional uh friendly yeah Ed, a lot or angry i guess you know i guess it could go the other way too so you you know you know him well enough to know this one thing that I've been kind of searching for, and it, it basically you know when Rosen and, and Josh Jaws Obrecht were interviewing him, his his around Van Halen too, he started to feel the pressure from his fame, and he he voices this in these interviews mm -hmm. that how how difficult it's becoming to deal with not only Roth and and all that, but the fame that that's coming with it. Long way later in his career, like in the times that you were around him, you know, do you think there was any like the isolation was a thing for him or I don't think so. No, uh, you think he was pretty not at that point in time, at least. Uh, sure, sure. No, no, he would he would just go out by himself. I mean, it's it wasn't he would go to this Ralph's down the street from his house. Yeah. And, you know, people knew him and, and it's like. No, he didn't. No, later. I don't think later. I mean, maybe earlier that was more of an issue at first, you know, when he was. But later, he didn't seem to care. Yeah, he must have got to a point with it where he just accepted that whole. Or maybe people weren't just it wasn't quite the same fanfare that there once was, you know. Uh, but uh, no, he would he would just go go yeah, out you, you hear all kinds of great stories like him at guitar center and yeah you know, go out and do stuff yeah you know that, cool. there was one story he bought the kid at 57 because the kid was asking what kind of mic they should get him and he, mm -hmm. should, he goes you should ask this guy right here and it was eddie van halen eddie said 57 and he bought it for him and then the, the kid brought it back the next day <laughs> which is the crazy story that was at the one on ventura out there <laughs> yeah you know now we got wolfgang out there what do you what do you think Wolf's awesome. Yeah. He's a nice he's a he's a nice guy. Uh I mean I've known him since he, you know, first met him when he was when I was doing rigs for his dad, you know. And uh and I do his rigs now. Yeah, right, right. Oh, so it's a torturous past, you know. He's a good kid. I mean, I, I met him. Yeah, he's uh, great. I met him one time and you know, it was uh this is when he was with Romani out there on the road after right. the Van Halen tours. And they were doing meet and greets after the show in these small little places, you know, a couple hundred people. And uh, they were like, if you stay around for, you know, some merch or whatever, we'll meet everybody. So we just were able to hang out and meet him. And he was super cool. And, you know, I got the, even though he was 21 or whatever at the time, I just got the distinct impression, you know, that he had such a reverence for the his dad's history. Like he really, sure. he really knows his dad's history, you know. And yes. Was, yes. I mean, he's a very, a very talented guy. Yeah. I mean, he, you know, I, I would venture to say he was, he's might be more talented than his father was. I mean, that father was very talented, but 
I mean, Wolf's a real multi-instrumentalist. I mean, like, you know, plays everything on the record, the drums, the vocals, the ev just everything. And, and you know, that, that's not easy, man. No not easy. No that's not easy. And writes the songs. And, you know, so it's, it's, man, it's all encompassing there, you know? Tell you what, though, the, the pressure that, you know, and, and hate that he's, he's faced over the, you know, oh yeah i mean i think that's a bunch of crap i mean it's incredible i mean look look he's not his dad he's not van halen he's a van halen right but he it's his own music it's his own merit it needs to be his own you know sure, sure. uh totally agree yeah, yeah no and you know if you don't like it the fact he doesn't play a van halen song you know tough not van halen right oh you know? yeah it's he's funny. got his own songs and his own merit to stand on and i think I, I applaud that it's funny when i saw him in 07 i did the uh sound check in 07 and i walked into the you know we walked into the sound check and they're playing i'll wait mm -hmm. and, and and wolfgang singing lead mm -hmm. at this point people don't realize that he was singing Way, way. Yeah, he's a he's a great vocalist, you know. I I kind of look at Wolfgang almost like you know another Dave Grohl or something, you know. Like yeah. he's like writing songs that are you know more in the vein of a Foo Fighters kind of thing, I think. Sure. And I think uh, and, and I think they're cool, and I think the videos have a sense of humor, and I think it's fun. And, hilarious, exactly. you know, you know, <laughs> with all the the same wolf, you know, all of this. <laughs> I I mean, like that. That's that's awesome, man. You know, this last one was great. You know, with his mom in it. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. The whiskey and all that. You know, it's, yeah. <laughs> I thought that was yeah, fun. so fantastic. Yeah. So yeah. your world, in, in your world, you know, as far the kind of the kind of sent you up here. To uh, you have, I think you said a vintage line coming out. You've mentioned this. I do have a vintage line coming out with a, a plexi style amp. Okay, uh, it kind of mimics my fifty watt plexi that I have with a built in variac. It's gonna have all the little tricks and stuff, but it, it's not just strictly a Van Halen amp either. Uh, it will do a variety of plexi tones. So one channel though, primarily. Yeah, one channel, no loop, no nothing. It's it's vintage styled amp crank it up and go it, it does have a post phase master on it though that i put on it but a sp particular circuit that i found that i like okay you know that's different volume, than most the master volume you know is it's so funny with marshall's maybe you can answer this for me because i think you guys had what's his name uh, santiago uh-huh alvarez right yeah okay y'all had him on there and at one point he was talking about the redesign and redo of the silver jubilee uh -huh. which, which I own one of those, re, you know, the reissues. Mm -hmm. And the first thing, because it'd been so long since I'd ever played one, you know, in the eighties, the master volume on that is very unusual, at least on this version of it, where it's, it's very linear. Mm -hmm. We're all marshals that I know are like by three, you're dead. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, even why, the original amps were, were kind of that way. Yeah. Why, why do they, don't have the, the mm, yeah that's a good question i mean that amp's really different from uh from uh any other marshall yeah i think so too it's the diode clipping in it and it's it doesn't have a cathode follower and it's very different it's just a very different amp. it is a very different amp. i really think a, the jubilee only sounds good like slash amount of gain you know what i mean i i don't you can't really drive it hard it, it just wants to be a crunchy les paul amp and you got to get a little volume on it too, because it needs to come alive, you know. And That's it's just that fast, quick, crunchy uh, thing. And then it sounds good, but down really low, it doesn't sound really that great. No, uh, too much gain cranked on it? Nah, not really. It gets kind of flubby and weird. And you, you just want the gain down around six or something, and then turn the master up some, and then it then it then it goes. Oh, there we go. Yeah, which is how slash would have run it and run it you know it's not like heavy game or any mean but, but it's a good sound yeah i have a 77 jmp that's that's you you wouldn't believe this story but basically i was working at a store music store right and we used to do when we did trades we could just pay whatever the difference was and get whatever hmm. it was, right so right i got this thing for sub 200 dollars <laughs> Great. Well, I got my Plexi for three hundred. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, you know, in nineteen ninety something, right. or ninety or something. 
Yeah, you know, like the there was like a going price for Marshall Cabin. It's like four fifty, five hundred bucks. You know, you can get them all. Mm, yeah, and, sure. And then you know, of course, at that point where you're over doing racks is when in my area the MP1 became the thing. Oh yeah, of course, yeah, sure. Uh, it became like the the budget way to do a a high switching system. You know. Yeah, the MP1. Yeah, that was a that was. It was like you know, like you could get a sound out of it, maybe. Maybe one, one sound. It had a, you know that clean was a, it was kind of a almost the clean the clean was okay you know it, yeah, it, it, it did some Skid stuff. Row if you think Skid Row you that's it man that, yeah you know life yeah. clean and the and I guess Vito Brada used it a good bit yeah yeah but, yeah you know, that's an amazing thing but yeah the whole rack revolution and then it kind of a, going backwards you know back to heads and one of the things you mentioned earlier and, and I will kind of close with this is about volume. This is something that I have struggled with mightily locally as a, as a local guy and with heads and volume. Now I've a few years ago, we had a real push against volume downtown in our local area. They were like holding us to 80 DB. And oh like, yeah. It's crap. And then we've got a couple clubs now that are just, they want real drums. They want it loud and they don't want any of that. Now, we so we have sort of this back and forth. So I'll use the, the small box when I'm in places where I, you know, don't get crap, but then I end up doing the ears and a model or other places. So I'm constantly going back and forth between the two kind of schools. But, you know, out in LA, what's that like? Is it, they still kind of, is it, I know the casinos are real. Well, well it depends. It, it depends on the venue. Uh, you know, the whiskey, they don't give a shit. Yeah. doesn't matter so if you're going to play the whiskey you can be loud right. um some other places uh, it, it's interesting it depends on who's doing the loud playing and if they let you or not you know <laughs> i remember like a guy that works for me would play the viper room he goes i pretty much had my amp off it was so low it was like off and he was complaining it was loud and then Steve Stevens one time did a uh, all all star show there with Pete Thorne and everything. Steve's amp was on six or seven, <laughs> which a hundred watt amp. It was it was like you were floating away on a sound cloud, which is great. You know, it's <laughs> like you're just feeling you're feeling the amp and you're feeling it, which is awesome. Right. It's in, in a band environment, and imagine that they let him play that loud there. So I think it depends on where and what what you're you know what you're in. I don't I don't believe I don't believe there should be a cab a cabless stage. I I don't believe that's a good idea. I think it's a bad idea for the audience too because all right, if you're at a show and they they have um n nothing on stage and it's just all you're going to hear and very up close if you're up close to the stage you're not going to hear anything but drums maybe a little vocals you're just not going to hear anything and and it's just it uh, and that's just not how i grew up man like, yeah, it's not like you're saying about the brian adams show and, and and being up close like i noticed that too you know it was such a low you can't hear anything off the stage there's nothing off the stage I, I mean i was honestly surprised that they could fill that arena with little as little sound as i was hearing but you know obviously it's over here yeah know? yeah yeah and yeah i just don't i think i think you know i think you could have a moderate amount of volume mm -hmm. and still sound better, you know? Sure. Uh, but I still firmly believe that if the drums are this loud, well, then the bass should be an equal amount and the guitar amps should be an equal amount. So if you're standing there with no PA on, sounds relatively balanced. And you, you could listen to it, you know? <laughs> that's the way i grew up right that's the way i believe it should be right right yeah. and then the pa is just to fill it in right. you know and 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 you know yeah it, it does there is a there you know like you said if you go to a uh, cab stage cabo stage and if you're up close you don't you're right you get drums <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> it's, awful. It's, got a little fill, it's, it's still awful like, depressing Never enough fill in the front, even if they have fill in the front. Yeah, it's yeah. awful, depressing, not exciting, and eh. like you said, yeah, yeah. Earlier, the, 
one of the funny stories about Eddie Van Halen was that I was at the Phillips Arena in uh, I think it was 07, and his whole the whole PA went down. Uh huh. In the middle of eruption. <laughs> oh, awesome. <laughs> so he's like just coming into the solo, and then shoo, nothing. <laughs> But his cabinets on stage, they were great. <laughs> so we were pretty close, and we could hear it pretty good. But he, yeah. didn't, he didn't know at first at all. He it just kind of took him a second to kind of figure out that there wasn't anything coming out the front. And he just kept – I he was like – he just stopped. <laughs> Everybody was like, oh, no, somebody's going to get killed for this. <laughs> the whole yeah. audience was like, Eddie, Eddie. <laughs> cheering him on. And That's awesome. He did, he did great. They kicked, he finally came back on, but I talked to Tom Weber about that. And he said, yeah, I remember that night. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nightmare. Yeah. I was at a show somewhere. Where was it? Uh, I don't remember. I had to fly out to a show and I remember watching him on stage and something was happening with his monitor that he had on stage. And I watched him from front of house i watched him drag the monitor because he kept like going it's you know it's fucked up or out or something it kept going kept going no one's listening to him no one's doing anything no one's nothing he unplugged it drug it crossed to side stage and threw it off the side stage <laughs> as i'm watching this i'm like going the monitor consoles right there is it gonna land on top of it if so show's over Right, right, it did. Right. It tumbled down the stairs on the side, but he literally threw it off of the stage. He was pissed. I remember this. This is the uh, <laughs> New, Jersey, it was a New Jersey show. Might think, have been, yeah. I think so because it was a. There was something that happened at that show with his ear too. Like he had a problem. Something. Oh yeah, to, something. No, like he got if some feedback from something, and it, it spiked in his ear, and then he couldn't hear. And I, I don't. Yeah, that was a terrible, terrible thing. That yeah, happened. he was pissed. Yeah. Right. Like uh, show's over, man. <laughs> Here we go. Wow. Well, oh boy, I appreciate you coming on, man. I, I I've been wanting to get you on here for a long time, and yeah, and, uh, I mean, we can do it. We can do it again sometime. And just yeah, you uh, know, I might do a round table with a bunch of people. You know, maybe get Phil X on and we'll do something again at some point, maybe on a birthday. yeah, okay, celebration sure. or something like that. And uh, yeah, it's you know the stuff that you and Pete do together is fantastic. Always, Pete's always awesome, and yeah. Oh, watch yeah. that. And of course, we're a bunch talk. of we're a bunch of geeks. Yeah, and tone talk. I, you know, it's it's funny. I don't know how my YouTube knows this, but somehow it always pulls you up when I'm asleep. <laughs> there you go. I wake up and that's today. It's Mike Soldano again. <laughs> like, what the hell is this doing, that guy? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, we've got some good ones. I hope to have some other good ones coming up. So. All right, I can't wait to see what's coming. I'm always interested. I was just starting on the the guy from Iconic Guitars. That was the one that from. Oh yeah, Kevin's movie. awesome. He's 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 a good he's a great guy friend. Well, thanks for spending some time with me, man. And uh, I'll see you probably. Yeah, man. If you're at Nam. I don't know if you're going to do that or not this year. You you were talking about sort of maybe. Um, you know. Well, I think we're going to have a meeting room there, but that's not really for the public. Right. Although on the show with Kevin, I was hatching an idea about getting a uh, like a hotel suite. Yeah. Right. And uh, and just doing kind of a small little thing in the hotel suite where people could come up and maybe see some of the latest things and stuff, and just you know be a more one-on-one -on -one experience as, as opposed to uh, sure. the Nam thing. Which because Kevin did that that last year for his guitars or some of his new guitars, yeah. And that was pretty cool, man. People would come to the suite. You know, it was like it was like you know you could sit around, you could play the guitars, and it was quiet, and you know. I mean, you can't turn up anything really loud, but you know, you, you can play it a little bit. You know, it's fine. Well, that's cool, yeah. Because you, you, always, you always had your uh, your Friedman bar in the in the Nam booth. <laughs> yeah, but if we have the suite, we'd have the bar again, right? Yeah, oh. there's a bar in the suite, so it's this built in. There you go. Oh. All right, man. Well, thanks for spending time with me, man. I appreciate you. And if you ever need anything from me, you let me know. All right, man. Thanks, so, buddy. All right. Have a good night. I'm going to go. All right. Yeah, see you. Bye-bye.